Okay, it's that time again, and we are back for another Contagious Leadership podcast. Lorianne, are you excited? I am really excited about today's show. Yes. Yeah, today's going to be good. Today's going to be good. We have in the studio, Terry Rice. He's sitting in the back watching right now, getting ready to come on. We're going to get into some really great stuff. If you are right now an individual who's either looking to create your own business, your own idea, and you're trying to figure out how to do it, or you've already gone that route and you're stuck, mm -hmm. stick around because you're going to be very excited about what Terry's going to bring. And he's going to talk to you a little bit about what he does and how he helps that specific area. We'll be back in 30 seconds with Terry. So did that music get you pumped, Terry, or what? That was pretty cool. I actually recognized some of the people uh, in the clips, too. <laughs> well done. But anyways, welcome to the show, Terry. Yeah. Welcome, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. So uh, as we were kind of prepping for this, there's a lot of great things that we wanted to talk about and ask. Uh, both Lorianne and I both have a lot of questions, but why don't you introduce yourself? Let the, let the world know here who's watching. Uh, a little bit about your story and and kind of how you got here. I'd, I'd love for you to explain that in your words. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. Uh, I'll start off by saying I have four kids. So pretty much everything I do is outside of that, right? So that's the, the main job. But how did I get where I am? Uh, I think like a lot of people, I went to college assuming that's the route you had to go <laughs> to get a job and be fulfilled. And I did that for both undergrad and business school. But once I got into the working world, which included roles at Adobe and, and as well as Facebook, I found I just didn't like it whatsoever. And it was a weird feeling because I remember looking around one day and saying, look, I don't ever want my manager's job or that person's job or actually anyone's job here, including my own. <laughs> and when you work at a tech company, there is this almost like you feel ungrateful for everything that you have and confused. But that's what led me to, in 2015, starting my own business, where I more or less continued what I was doing uh, as, as a corporate person, meaning digital marketing and offering that as an individual. But as time went by, I actually switched to doing biz dev for other people, other solopreneurs and entrepreneurs who want to monetize their, mon their knowledge primarily. And the benefit is I can just help them avoid all the mistakes I made <laughs> and save them a lot of time, frustration, and help them make more money. Oh, I love it. I want to dive into the mistakes already. <laughs> yeah, yeah a lot. Lori Ann, go ahead, man. You can take I, me. I'm like always fascinated with, and just to hear you say, you know, like in your corporate job, you looked around and it was just like, I mean, like that's a lot of self-awareness, but it's, and I'm always so fascinated by people's pathways, but to hear you say like, I want to help people not make the mistakes that I made. I like I don't even I don't even know what question like to start with, but what's the biggest mistake that that you help people with? Let's just start there. Well, there's a few. I mean, a lot of people right now are thinking about pursuing a side hustle or becoming a solopreneur. The natural thought is, okay, whatever I'm doing with my nine to five right now, I'm gonna do that as a as an individual. But when you have the freedom to say, look, I don't have to keep on doing the same thing over and over again, because maybe for your nine to five, you do marketing, like all kinds of marketing. Maybe you only really like email marketing. Great. Double down on that. Right. And be really niche and be really focused. But I think we we sometimes feel the urge to replicate what we've done internally before, as opposed to saying, well, let me just think about some other possibilities that I could do. And then from there, move forward. The other thing I would say is this, I, I spent a lot of time working in my business before I worked on my business. Mm. And by that, I mean, just trying to get clients, right? <laughs> just saying, hey, here's this thing, do you wanna buy it, so on and so forth, as opposed to putting together the actions, tools, and mindset needed to be successful. So I know everyone says, just get started, but yeah, you can get started building first <laughs> before amplifying what you built. And that's each the, the, the two of the major issues that I had. I can, I, yeah. <laughs> Work, yeah, working, working in your business versus on, and you know, I think, I think most, uh, 
most entrepreneurs, most solopreneurs, when we start off, right? Um, I think that's very common. I, I know for myself, I found myself uh, uh, really recognizing quite early, this was not my first business uh, that I had started in my lifetime. And I had taken a large break and I knew that the next time I was not gonna do it alone. So I think I had some very, very valuable life lessons and financial lessons that taught me a few mistakes I made the last time. So my question, Terry, for you is, I believe that anybody getting into building something for the first time or second or third really should never be doing it without a, a sounding board, a coach, some type of, uh, some type of, 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 place where they can work through finding a lot of these things out, not making the same mistakes twice. So to Lori Ann's question to you, what have you found as being the largest obstacle with solopreneurs in getting into a program like the kind that you offer for your, for, for your clients? What I would say is, and this is going to be somewhat contradictory to what you said is, before you join a community, get a coach, coach by a course, do anything, become more self-aware, do some deep inner work. Okay. So what's my personal philosophy? What's the vision I want to have? You know, what, what work do I enjoy? And let's get some kind of clarity around that and then find someone else to help you. But if you're not sure what you want to do, but then you go pay some coach, you know, X thousand dollars to help you figure it out. They might just tell you what sounds good to them <laughs> or the easiest way to make you feel like you've made some progress. So mm -hmm. I always say start with that deep inner work. And that's that's tough. Like so when I, when I talk to people, I say, what is your personal philosophy? What are the thoughts that guide your words and your actions? And if you can't answer that question, that's fine. But let's start with that deep inner work. Next, what is your vision? You know, how do you want to be known? What do you want your weekends to look like? What kind of work do you want to do? And from there, again, we can say, all right, well, if that's your vision. Here's some pathways you can take. But if you don't have that clarity, I would say clarity is the precursor to confidence. If you don't have that clarity, how can you confidently move forward with something, even if it sounds like a good idea? And then, yeah, once you do that, sir, find some communities, right? I think you should start there with like free online communities before you pay anyone and get that support because you might have friends, family members, whoever it is who support your dream, but they're not in it, right? They can't give you real feedback and support the way you might want it. And then beyond that, they might also let their self-limiting beliefs impact your your plans as well. <laughs> so you, you gotta look out for getting, you gotta watch out when you're getting advice from someone who's never done <laughs> what you're trying to do successfully <laughs> yes. because they're kind of just shooting from the hip. That's a great point. What, what I want to talk about uh, or just ask you about is I think a lot of people brush over this foundational part, you know, like what's your vision, what's your philosophy, you know, on things. I think we have people have a tendency to brush through this really fast. What it, like what, what advice do you give people about really spending the needed time in this phase? Because I, I know that people just like, but I want to I want to get started. I want to get started. And they just like they're almost like leapfrogging when they should just like sit. Yeah, I mean, the reason why they rush through it is because it just does not feel like real work, right? It's like, mm -hmm. oh, I, I gotta go on social media. I have to like make my website, I have to do all this stuff. That's why. But if you realize that you're setting the foundation for everything you'll do from there, and again, you'll be more confident moving forward, that should be the motivation that you need. And, and I also think, you know, what's the rush to get started too, because Maybe you find out, you know what, I actually hate this. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I hate the fact that I'm being an entrepreneur and I have to build all these things. Like this feels a lot like work. Gosh, you're gonna keep on doing stuff like this over and over again. Cause the next step is, you know, writing your about section, creating your website, your offering, your marketing, all this stuff. If you this does not feel good, maybe you should have a nine to five again because it's like yeah. this ain't gonna stop anytime soon. And whenever I find someone looking for the latest hack or the, the fastest route, I'm like, you learn along the way, right? Yeah. And you fail along yeah. the way, but failure is data. But if you've never done these things, then you arrive at this place that you weren't ready for or might find that you don't like whatsoever. So yeah. that's really what separates good from great or failure and success is doing that deep inner work first, which, yeah, can be boring <laughs> or does not seem like real work or is really challenging. But once you get there, gosh, everything else becomes clearer. And I'll say this one more thing. One great book I recommend reading is Limitless by Jim Quick. And he talks about have, being very clear on your dominant question. And I'll explain what that means in a moment. But he, he tells a story of how his sister wanted a pug, a pug dog uh, for, her, for her birthday. And as soon as she said that, as he was walking around throughout his day, he kept on seeing pugs everywhere. 
same area he used to walk in all the time, but all of a sudden he saw pugs everywhere. It's because he had pugs on his mind, right? So therefore on your end, you have to find a dominant question you're trying to answer or else you'll walk by it all the time and not recognize it just like he didn't find those pugs, didn't see those pugs. So my dominant question is how can I create content that helps people and allows me to support my family? That's it. That's my dominant question. So when opportunities like that come my way, I can look at it and say, oh, wow, that's it. That answers my dominant question. But if some, some someone says, oh, can you consult me one on one on how to do this thing? I'm like, mm, that's not really answering the question. That's how that's helping an individual. But I want to do it at scale. So am I saying I don't do that? Mm, I do. But sparingly, because my dominant question is, how can I create content that helps people and also helps me support my family? So you have to get clear in your dominant question. How to do that? That deep work that no one wants to do. Right. <laughs> but if you don't do it, you're walking by the answers all the time and you don't know what they are. I love that. And and you say this a lot, right? One of the things that you talk about is helping individuals being able to find that purpose, to be able to build that that dream job doing something that they already love. So that makes a lot of sense. And and uh, I'm sure I slaughtered that. If you want to say it exactly the way it's supposed to be. I mean, it's whatever make, way makes sense to you, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't have to be the <laughs> no, way that that's fair. It. But um, the goal here is to design your business around your life, not mm. the other way around. And you can do so with great intention. But again, that's why you need a vision. What do you want your life to look like? If, you, if you're like me and you want to have more time to play with your kids on the weekend, great let's develop some passive revenue streams if you want to travel the world or even just the country great let's get some speaking gigs right you know that's 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 the way it goes uh, but if you don't have that clarity you can't move forward and again you won't you'll, you'll miss the answers to your dominant question as you're walking by them but you get to decide what success is not me not society not some influencer you're jealous of <laughs> you know it's you and i think one thing that we often ignore when we talk about success is Success might be making $60,000 a year, but having more time for your health, your family, your, ho your hobbies. Maybe making $3 million a year, you know, you're, you're, you look successful externally, but internally you're a nervous wreck, you have no time for anything, and your kids are calling you Terry instead of dad, right? So <laughs> you design your operational definition of success, you don't let yeah. society tell you what it is. So Terry, what would you say to somebody, because I love this dominant question, um, philosophy actually, uh, what would you say to somebody who's like, you know, they've been in business for a little while, they feel like they're still struggling with getting things Things going like what would you suggest to them like ha, ha, to come up with like their their question since they're kind of you know like you sort of suggest like you do this work in the beginning but if you already have have a business that's running what would you tell them I would tell them to pause first of all stop working stop taking on new clients and just focus on yourself <laughs> And again, if you go through these exercises where you develop your personal philosophy and your vision, you can find examples of other people who have found success in the same lane. And I'm not saying copy everything they're doing, but success leaves clues. If you realize, oh, they have a newsletter and here's how they structure it. Oh, they do a lot of podcasts. They write a lot of content, whatever it is, you can reverse engineer that process and therefore it's much more clear on how to move forward. And I would also say, don't feel like you've wasted your time because that's First of all, it's a useless emotion to feel <laughs> that, that regret, but see it all as a learning experience and saying, okay, well, here's what I enjoyed about this. Here's the things that didn't feel too good. And I know I should avoid those going forward, but to recap, success leaves clues. So once you get that clarity, find other people who do, are finding success in the same, same route, but also make sure that they are kind of recently doing this stuff, not someone who's been established for 20 years and you're trying to say, oh, I guess I should advertise in the phone book. Like, that's not a good look, right? <laughs> so you want to find someone who can give you modern techniques and approaches, not someone who just has been successful since the early 90s, <laughs> because that stuff doesn't work anymore. Yeah, I love that. And, and you know, there is a lot of things happening and there's a lot of changes. And there are a lot of folks out there who are influencers that have that same positive attitude and that same that same attitude that says, I'm going to give back to help this level or this group get to this point, whatever the case is, you made a comment earlier, there are tons of free bits of information that's out there that people can re research and find and, and essentially get better at what it is that they're doing. And I, I love your attitude towards this. I love the self-awareness and I, I really like your comment, the success leaves clues. Now you obviously made a bit of a splash coming into this for yourself, LinkedIn, which is a platform I really enjoy, you've seen to make a, a pretty good impact 
on LinkedIn, uh, really being recognized by them. And I, one of the things that I found really interesting was your, your inclusion in, in the entrepreneur magazine. And you have this in your, in your title as a expert in residence. I'd love to know how that came to be with entrepreneur magazine. Yeah. Let me answer a question that you didn't ask first, because I want to make sure I hit on it. Why am I so active on LinkedIn? Well, I think we can often realize that our perceived disadvantages are actually an advantage. And on my end with four children, I can't go to random networking events, hoping, hoping to meet someone who can help me grow my business or learn from. So I was forced to go on a platform like LinkedIn and grow that way. And I remember when my third son was born or third child was born, I couldn't barely think straight. So all I did for a month was just commented 10 times per day on various accounts, just commenting 10 times per day. That alone got me two speaking gigs and two clients. So that's why I'm, I'm so active on LinkedIn is because I didn't have any, any choices. And then beyond that, the reason why this is me self-assessing, the reason why I excel at doing online instruction and online courses is because I teach at NYU as well as General Assembly. But as I had more kids, it was harder for me to teach in person. So I've been mm. teaching on Zoom since 2016. So when the pandemic hit and all of a sudden that was the thing to do, I already had 3000 hours of instruction logged online instruction. So I'm just bringing this up for anyone who feels like, gosh, this guy sounds cool, but I don't have time for all this stuff. Hey, neither did I, but I found a way. And I think through clarity, through constraints, you can find clarity because there's the paradox of choice. Meaning when you have too many choices, you feel overloaded and you also feel like you might've made the wrong decision afterwards. On my end, I'm like, I got three choices. <laughs> so, so that's it. <laughs> it makes it a lot easier to say, that's the choice you're, you're gonna make and go in as hard as you can on it because you don't have any other options. So that's, that's my story. The Love question it. you asked was in regards to Entrepreneur Magazine, how that came to be. And oddly enough, that's actually a function of constraints as well of being a parent. So at this time, my daughter, Lena, was, I believe, around three years old. And I eventually said to myself, look, I'm not working on weekends anymore because she's at the point where she realizes dad's leaving on the weekend and asking me where I'm going and can she come? The answer is no. So about two weeks later, actually my mother-in-law discovered, or actually I think it's my wife, uh, discovered there was this free gymnastics class being offered here in Brooklyn. Drop in, see if you like it. If you do, sign your kids up, right? So I go there with my daughter because I'm not working on the weekends anymore. And I walk in and Jason Pfeiffer is there with his son, Fenn, who's the same age as my daughter. And Jason Pfeiffer is the editor in chief of Entrepreneur Magazine. You can actually see his book over my right shoulder right over here. Um, and I'm like, holy cow, that's, that's Jason Pfeiffer. And how did I know that? Because I'd been researching him and following him on social media for years. And what, what I'm gonna tell you right now might seem like I got lucky, but I'll tell you right now, luck is when preparation and opportunity are met with action. Right. I agree. hundred percent. A hundred percent. My preparation. I'm following the guy on social media opportunity, bring my daughter to this class action. I went up and talked to him. I said, Hey man, I love your podcast. He's like, well, what do you like about it? He's like, actually, how do you know who I am? And then he's like, well, what do you like about my podcast? <laughs> so we're talking, we're talking, we're talking. Eventually we have a coffee meeting a few weeks later. And this part I do want to harp on. There was a platform that entrepreneur um, has and more or less, I saw that there were some ways to improve the, the user uh, experience on the website. So I made a video saying, hey, everyone, this site looks great. Here's three things you can do to fix it. And I gave Jason a copy of this video. It's like a, a Loom link. And that got circulated around Entrepreneur. A day later, they're like, hey, can you come in? We want to talk to you about some marketing products we need your help with. That's how it all happened. So two steps, one is be a dad, three is <laughs> proactively solving a problem for your prospects or target audience, and therefore giving instead of focusing on what you can take. So when you focus on what you can give as opposed to what you can take, things just work out better. So that's my, my story about entrepreneur. I love, so what you're really saying is just another reason where kids can actually make you money, not cost you money. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Good, you good know summation. what? I, I, no, I, I love that because th there's so many times that these opportunities happen. And if you really stop and look and you go back the way you did, right? Reverse engineer that, really go back and go back through the steps and realize there was a lot of decisions you made to get there. And yeah, you could easily say, right? Like, oh, you were lucky or you're in the right place at the right time. Uh, I forget who says it. I'll, I'll be honest with you, but I, I say it here a lot to the team. And a lot of times I'll just tell them it's interesting. The harder you work, 
the more lucky you get, right? And it just feels like the harder you work at something, the more you read, the more you, you research, the more that you prepare yourself, it seems like the luckier you get. And, you know, I, I know that not to be true, but if that's what somebody wants to call it, sure, luck. Okay. I'd rather be lucky than anything else, but it always seems to work out that way. And, and I love that, that, that story. I think it's great. It's a great story. I, I, I love yeah. how you just walked up to him. You, I mean, a lot of people would be like, oh, I know, I know who that is. And I'm just going to sit here. But you walked over to him just to say, hey, I love your podcast. And I like his question. What do you like about it? Because mm -hmm. as, as a podcast host myself, when people say that, like, I actually want to know, like, are they actually listening to it? Or that, are, is that something that they're, they just randomly said? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. one thing to note about that is, so first of all, it was his birthday because I heard him mm. talking to his wife about his birthday plans. So I'm like, how do I interrupt this guy while he's talking about his birthday plans? But again, in these moments, you have to realize that the window of opportunity is so small and so fleeting. If you don't take it, you're in trouble. You can miss it. In my head, I was like, well, maybe his kid will take the class and then my daughter will be in the same class as him and I'll see him next week. Guess what? He never came back. <laughs> he never came back. So if I did not take that time to interrupt him and say, hey, my apologies, but wouldn't happen, right? So that's why it's so important. Like if you if you feel that urge, you have usually seven seconds to take action, seven seconds. After that, the window, the opportunity, the whatever is gone. So go with it. And the worst thing that can happen is you look foolish, but it's better than wondering what if. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and I wouldn't say um, you may feel foolish, right? But you know, the reality is, right? Like you just said, if you don't take it, how do you know? Like you, it's, you know, always, it's always a no if you don't make the ask. Yeah, it's already a no. That's exactly right. Like, you know, and especially even if it's just the opportunity to introduce yourself, maybe this person remembers you, maybe they don't, you know, but the point is, is you left an impression. And I, I think that that's great. But the, 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 the thing that I got out of it is really is you knowing the market and sense of what you're looking that that feeds you. And you didn't just say, Oh, like this was great. You actually had, you had something to give back. And I thought that was pretty great. I thought that was pretty powerful. So talk to me about your podcast that you have. I've watched uh, a handful of episodes. I like it. Um, and I like your focus. I like the focus on, on the small business, uh, the idea of building something. Um, through your own skill sets. I'd love to you talk a little bit more about that. So the podcast is called Launch Your Business. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm making content for the person I was seven years ago, who had good ideas, who had ambition, but no structure whatsoever <laughs> around how to actually run a business. And for me, it's even more embarrassing because I have an MBA, right? I went to business school, like this is what I'm supposed to be doing and had no clue what I was doing. So that's why it's so easy for me to create the content because I'm thinking to myself, what information did I need back then when I was struggling, when I was confused, when I didn't have any money that would have helped me? So if you listen, you realize I skipped a lot of the fluff and like the pomp and circumstances. I'm like, here's what you have to do in a practical way. <laughs> if you do this, you will be on your merry way and, and make money. And that stems from my background as a teacher, as an educator. I want to I want you to actually do something after the podcast that has a positive impact on you. So when I'm selecting who even to interview, I don't want someone just talking about how cool they are, how they made a billion dollars last year, so on and so forth, because that's not where my audience is yet. And often they're saying things that cannot be repeated, right? So I want to have repeatable frameworks that are aligned with the outcome you're looking for, as opposed to someone just bragging and saying, oh, look at all this cool stuff I did. So there are a lot of people that reach out to me to be on the show that I say no to, because I'm like, that would not have helped me seven years ago. That actually would have made me jealous, <laughs> but not in a way that inspires me. <laughs> and as a result, I focus on people who provide value based on what I wanted to accomplish and what I know a lot of other people want to accomplish as well. I, I just want to emphasize that for everybody, create the content mm -hmm. that you were a few years ago because there's a lot of people out there coaches consultants you know other business owners that are just like i know i have to create content but i don't know what to create well the content they create sometimes you can just tell that they're not i don't know they're not they're not talking to a person they're mm -hmm. talking to a platform and they're giving like it could even be like good content but if it doesn't feel specific and individualized then it's not going to work so often what i'll do is i'll just tell a story about how i messed up True story, I, when I first started doing uh, digital marketing consulting, I told some guy I charged 500 bucks a month, which is 
way too low for anyone. And he didn't ask any questions about my services. He just said, can you do it for 400? And I wish I could say that's where the story ended, but it didn't, I took the 400. So I'll tell that story and then I'll say, yeah. here's how you should actually structure your pricing. But if I just bomb in information, like here's how to structure your pricing with no context or backstory, I'm gonna keep scrolling too, right? So your, your, personal, your personal brand is the only unique differentiator you have. And the way that you share that is by telling stories, experiences, perspective, worldviews, so on and so forth, because just being good at your job is a prerequisite. You do not get rewarded for it the same way you would at a nine to five. As an entrepreneur, you're supposed to be good at your job. Now what else? And the, and the cool thing is you don't have to appeal to everyone. I always say you should be more like Nickelback. If you Google most hated band in the world, Nickelback's <laughs> going to show up. But if really? you also Google, oh yeah, I mean, I don't hate them, but like that's, this is the popular <laughs> sentence. This is a good, this is a good example. I, no, I just, I, I think it's funny that. I their songs in my speeches. <laughs> well, well there, but to your point though, uh, let me hop, hop in here. Yeah. To your point though, if you Google most successful Canadian band in history, guess who shows up? Hmm. Nickelback. So the people that love them, really love them, the people that hate them, they make jokes, but it is what it is, right? So yeah. for you with your personal brand, you should not try to appeal to everyone because when you're speaking to everyone, you speak to no one. So you want to be like Nickelback <laughs> is the moral story. It makes so much sense. And I, I love that there's a focus there. What's been great listening to you is a lot of confirmation into some of the things that we're doing. And you know, this program right here, this has come from a want and a desire to help other individuals and to help create what we call like this contagious behavior, this contagious leadership attitude, because we believe that really at the heart of this, you know, we have a responsibility to help, especially a younger generation, get that modeling and get that coaching, get that, that mentorship that isn't available as, as much as it was when, when the rest of us were coming up in, in careers, right? And I love that because you're really just confirming that attitude. It's about being authentic and getting out there. And then things, things grow from that. And I think, you know, you, you really become self-aware through that process, right? Yeah, I'd agree. And also this, I mean, you can make a lot of money just by giving people valuable information because yeah. you're now a marketing channel, right? Oh, well, I'm on your newsletter. I follow you on social media because of X, Y, Z. And when people are ready, they'll reach out and say, Terry, you gosh, you know, I've been following you for a while, but now I'm ready to make a move. How can you help me? Yeah. Or what also ha happens to me quite often is organizations will reach out and say, hey, we have this program for entrepreneurs. Can you create content for us? Mm -hmm. Sure. How do they find me? Because I was giving away free content. Or if someone says, hey, Terry, can I pick your brain about this? Hey, you can go read my 50 articles I wrote for Entrepreneur. <laughs> and if you still have questions, <laughs> you know, here's a good way to here's a good way to move forward with that. But you can give yeah. someone an idea of what it would like to be work with you, to work with you asynchronously. And then if they do ch choose to, then yeah, obviously you get paid for it. So it just it just helps. And it also forces you to create to to consume content because you have to consume to create. Otherwise, you run out of ideas and you'll bore everyone, including yourself. I wish that I'd heard you say, Terry, like this whole thing about the content and just being yourself. Um, <laughs> wish that, that that that's what I wish that I had heard when I first entered into entrepreneurship. To be perfectly honest, I was one of those carbon copies of, of other people because I thought they knew better and that's what I was supposed to do. So I just kind of did what I saw other people doing. Um, but it, exactly the, the way that you just explained it, you know, about your content, your point of view, your philosophy on things, you know, when you're sharing that with people, I mean, I would imagine like, you know, it, you're right, like it just keeps attracting people and you're speaking to the right person and not the platform. That was the other thing that you said that I was like, oh, love that, wrote that down, actually speak to a person and not a platform. That was a really good statement. I thought that was, I thought that was awesome. Uh, okay, so help define solopreneur for those who are still wondering what the preneur buzz is all about. Cause we did a show last week on the Intrapreneur. Intrapreneur. So, solopreneur. Yeah, yeah. So today's the solopreneur. So, uh, you know, I want to make sure that we give uh, the audience an opportunity to understand the difference. Yeah. I mean, my operational definition might differ from someone else, but it's someone who's an entrepreneur, but is more or less a single person business. You might have assistants, you might have a remote team, so on and so forth, but it's you. It's your, it's often going to be 
a knowledge based business. You're not like selling, you know, shoes or whatever. Uh, it could be, but it, you're the main face of the business, the main decision maker, even though you have a team behind you. And the benefit of that is you just maintain a lot of flexibility in regards to your schedule, how you want to scale, making decisions, obviously, as well. And I think it's a great way for people to enter entrepreneurship if they want to grow a bit more. So maybe entrepreneurship, as you said, is the first step. So entrepreneurs are someone who, who innovates or someone who innovates internally. You might realize, gosh, I'm pretty good at this stuff. And I like shaking off the constraints of my nine to five. I'll now be moved to having a side hustle. Side hustle, you still have a nine to five, which you're doing this thing on the side. After a while, you're like, I can make a lot more money if I have this pesky job holding me back. <laughs> and then you move forward towards uh, solopreneurship. But maybe you decide from there, you want to scale even further and turn your service into a product or a SaaS based application. Mm -hmm. And that's when you become more of an entrepreneur because you have more teams, you have more resources. You might, again, you might have some products out there. So that's more or less the, uh, the progression. I like that. That's actually, I think, a really great definition. Uh, it is. Yeah, I think that that's great. Now I'm like, well, where? where I, I know. I, I'm, I'm a solo. I'm kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking. I'm so an entrepreneur. I'm, yeah, so I'm thinking, ah, probably still more on the solo side. But you know what? I love, I love that definition because that's one of the things that we've been working towards is how do we scale this? How do we make this where it's not just me, right? And that's what we're working towards. And it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of challenge. But it's a lot of fun to start shifting your business to where you could be in that role. So we're not there yet, but we're on our way. That's for sure. And let me let me jump in because it's never been easier to be a solopreneur with all the low code and no code tools available to run your business. So, for example, if you want to do email marketing, you can use ConvertKit. Super easy. You're on your merry way. 10 years ago, you had to hire the email marketing person, right? Yep. If you want a website, go to Squarespace. You're done in the yep. weekend. Yep. 10 years ago, you're hiring a webmaster or whatever. So there, it's, it's, it's a lot easier. And a lot of these, these low code or no code tools are, are pretty cheap, you know, between like 12 and 50 bucks a month. So for just a hundred bucks a month, you have the infrastructure needed to run your business, but you don't have to be an expert, a subject matter expert on email or on websites or on right now, you know, we're on, we're on Restreet, right? So all these mm -hmm. cool tools that are available to help you run your business without spending a lot of money and having a huge team. Yeah, no, love it. You're absolutely right. I, and that's the thing that I get excited about. For, for those that watch the show and have watched a lot of our shows, they know that my son, Donald, is the producer behind this. So here's this young man getting out of high school not long ago, and he's been involved in the business on the back end, learning a ton of skills that now he's doing for other clients as well. And so it didn't take long, right? I'm going to comment on that too, not to keep on interrupting you, but here's- No, please. Here's like, like, like This is the whole point of it. Well, that Here's what perplexes me, right? So people go to college to get experience, connections, and education, right? But they will not work for free to get experience, connections, and education. So what I find off is when someone starts a solopreneur business, I'll say, look, work for two or three clients for free just to get your feet wet, get some, some testimonials, some referrals. Oh, I'm not doing that. I make $200,000 a year. There's no way I'm working for free. And then they're surprised why no one wants to hire them. And I'm like, well, you have no street cred as it applies to being a solopreneur, right? So the yeah. same way that you went to whatever college and paid X thousand dollars to get the job you have now, just give out some, some free work just to get some experience because that helps you eliminate imposter syndrome because you're not being an imposter. You're straight up saying, look, I, I've never done this before. <laughs> step one. And step two is the other person knows like, hey, you're kind of working things through and they're not expecting perfection. They are expecting progress, but there's less pressure to perform. Right. So I always suggest that just work with two or three people for free before you start charging. And then you'll be much more confident going forward. After that. Totally agree. And you know, the other thing I noticed with that too, Terry, is that they're also really excited to give you advice and not the kind that you don't want to hear. Like they're seriously thinking through it and they're like, you know what, this could be really helpful or consider this or consider that. And they're not doing it in a way where it's like, you know what you should do, Terry, let me tell you what you should do. It's usually very, very open. I know that we've seen that quite a bit. So um, the question I did have for you was, out of the folks you've worked with, because I know you have coached tons now at this point and worked with so many different types of business owners, for that person who's looking right now to, to kind of prepare themselves mentally or, um, you know, even physically, but what, what are the, some of the best attributes you've seen out of the folks that really 
get the most out of out of that move and, and are the most successful? Like, what is the mindset of that individual? I'd love to hear a couple of those pointers so someone out there can get themselves prepared. Yeah, I'm going to try to throw out a bunch of buzzwords um, like growth mindset. Um, but I'd say yeah. one, yeah. one is curiosity. Because if you're curious to explore different pathways, different options, different ways to generate revenue, you won't be so closed minded when you come across things that don't initially seem too comfortable. So and also being curious is a function of just doing research. Right. The more you do, the more research you do, the more that you learn, the better prepared you are to move forward. So that, that curiosity is pretty important. And also just grit. And grit is you just saying, look, I'm going to push through this challenging situation, even though it's tough, even though I feel like I'm failing. But having that now, I will say <laughs> the, the growth mindset approach um, to seeing failure as data. And as a result of that, uh, pushing through to the challenge, to the your desired outcome. So those two, I would say, are, are top of mind. But the, I'm trying to think of the right way to say it. Just being altruistic as well. So when you meet someone else, you're focusing on what you can create together as opposed to what you can take. But if you're just really trying to meet people, trying to learn from them, trying to figure out how you can help them, then as a result, you'll draw the right people to you because the individuals who can help you the most are the ones who are just being hit up the most for someone, for, for people asking them random favors. So what I like to do is just proactively solve problems. If you're if you're willing to do that, if you're altruistic, right, and you're willing to act proactively solve these problems, you'll grow a powerful network and make a lot of money as a result. Ooh, that's God, really, that. that's really good. And yeah, I, I hate those people who are like, hey, let's connect and like, let's let me give you my pitch now. I'm like, this is not what this platform is for. You know, it's about building the relationships first and not the pitch. So thank you for well, sharing yeah. that. <laughs> and, and it runs, it runs completely. It's like, look, you guys, you, you're on a, and this is for anybody who's listening, by the way, and that's your job. Remember on LinkedIn, your connection, my gosh, most of us, like someone like myself, we have most of our stuff public. Yeah. So take two seconds and read it. So before you ask me if I'm interested in becoming a business owner, <laughs> that's right. oh, that yeah. one always gets me. That you seem, like, you seem like the right kind of guy with the right attitude who'd be interested in having a business for yourself. And I'm like, yeah. I'll give you a three-step process for how you actually connect with people on LinkedIn. Yeah, the let's do that. Is, I love it. The first is just get very clear on who you want to connect with, right? So who's your target audience? Is it a prospect? Is it a partnership? Is it a speaking engagement? Whatever it may be, but get very clear on these individuals and pick about 40 people. You can mix between, again, partnerships, uh, prospects, whatever it is, and then make sure they're actually active on LinkedIn. That's another mistake people make all the time. Like, oh, this person is perfect. Okay, look at their profile. They haven't posted since 2005, <laughs> right? Yeah. So yeah. they're never going to see your message. So yep. don't bother, right? And so they that's, only that's have four connections. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then what you want to do is just engage with their content. So make sure they post at least once a week. Engage with their content. Leave a thoughtful comment. Leave a, have a question. Don't just say like 100 or have an emoji or facts or whatever. Like actually engage with them. And then eventually you can reach out and say, hey, you know, Lorian, I've been checking out your content and it was amazing. You know, I'm actually on your web, your, your email list too. And in your last email, you said this, I have a question about that. That's how you do it. <laughs> you don't have to say, hey, Lorian, you look like a smart person who knows how to make some money in crypto. Let's, let's, let's hop on a virtual Zoom coffee. Like no one wants to do that. So it's this delayed gratification. It's very strategic. You know, it takes weeks. It might take months sometimes, but you're, you're doing it with great intent. And as a result of that, you're, when, you're, when you're commenting on their posts, then their audience is seeing it too. So you might build your network that way as well. That's how I get a lot of great, uh, a lot of great opportunities that I've been making money from is because by design, I'm looking for who I need to meet and I'm on the platform engaging, commenting when the time feels right, either I'll reach out to them or they reach out to me. That's all you have to do. Just practice delayed gratification. Delayed gratification. I love, I love that. So can you just like share with our audience, like how would you find some of those ideal people to connect with? Do you have a, do you have a search process? Yeah, I mean, it, it all goes back to being, you know, clear, right? So it's like, what do you, what's the vision for your life? Oh, my vision is I want to work with people who are e-commerce uh, store owners and help them with their email marketing. Great. There you go. Now go on LinkedIn and find these individuals either by typing in email marketing and looking for someone who has that in their, their bio or finding maybe it's a, a company or an influencer they might follow 
And then from there, look and see who's commenting there because that's your target audience. So pretend I'm selling pots and pans. I don't. But Martha Stewart would be an example of someone who attracts my audience. And when she posts, hey, look, I made a new cake, I can look at all the people who comment and then find people that I want to chime in with as well because that's my target audience, someone who might buy my pots and pans. So that's how you do it. You either find individuals or hashtags that'll help you find your target audience. Or if you really want to kick it up a notch, let's again pretend that I'm focusing on email marketing. Go to LinkedIn Learns and find a course on email marketing. And you can see everyone who's liked or rated that course. Then look at them and say, okay, what's this person's job? Not email marketing, great. They obviously have a need to learn more about it. Then you reach out and say, hey, Lorianne, I saw that you took this class on LinkedIn marketing or email marketing. I thought it was brilliant. By the way, I have this five-step process to see if you're losing money with your email marketing. I'd love to give you this PDF. What do you say? Right? So there's a few different ways, but it all starts with you not spamming people <laughs> and actually having clarity. And then from there, again, that delayed gratification. But it's, it's, it's incredibly easy. Last thing I'll say is this. Pretend you want to just talk to someone in the industry, right? Oh, there, there, it, is. Yeah. there it is. There it is. Like pretend you're brain. a real person, yeah, right? Yeah. Pretend they're real. Yeah. Pretend I, they're I, real. Yeah. So <laughs> I want to pick someone's brain, but not pay them for it. Again, go on LinkedIn, search for marketing manager, email marketing manager, engineer, whatever it is. Then there's a button that says advanced filters. There's a button you can click that says people who are open to pro bono consulting or volunteering push that button, then you can reach out and say, hey, Lorianne, I see you work in marketing and you're open to pro bono consulting. I have a few questions. Here's the research I've done already. Can I, do, do you feel comfortable with me asking you? There you go. Now you found someone who raised their hand and said they're willing for, or they're okay with people reaching out and asking them questions. That's all you gotta do. That is gold. Everybody yep. who's, who's watching, I mean, that is, those tips are gold. You better be writing the stuff down. <laughs> no, it's great. You know, it's, it's interesting, Terry, when I look back, I connected with you a long time back. And, you know, in terms of before I asked anything, and I think that's very interesting um, that just by nature, I think a lot of my preparation prior to getting here was what, what I always say, it's a long game. And to me, it's about building relationships. And I reached out to re, you know, to connect with you because you seem to be somebody that's doing things that I like, that I enjoy, and I want to hear about them, right? And so when we got enough where I felt like the show had a good enough platform, like I learned that lesson. And funny enough, a good friend of mine came by the other day and, and he does a lot of stuff with investors. And he said one of the biggest lessons he learned was don't pitch your good ones first right? Always pitch the ones you don't think are going to say yes. Uh, first, get them out of the way, get your bugs worked out, get your pitch down before you go to the, the ones you really wanted. So I'll be honest, I waited a few months before I said anything to you. Because I'm like, I want the platform to be attractive enough or Terry will say, yeah, I'd love to get on, you know, but uh, I, I like that because it's a perfect example. Just the way that we connected is a great example of how that works. So say, I like your focus on you know, waiting until you feel like you have a good platform. But I think there's also something to be said for looking forward to hearing the word no. And that's something I'm trying to get more of is more no's, especially for corporate contracts, because if I'm hearing more no more often, that means I'm pitching more often. And I don't have like this belief holding me back saying, oh, there's no way someone's gonna pay me $50,000 for LinkedIn training for their company. Find out, <laughs> you know what I mean? So last week I only got three no's, which doesn't mean I'm winning. It just means I didn't pitch enough <laughs> and I want to do that more often. So <laughs> yeah, to that. your point, you want to make sure that you have, you, you are presentable uh, in you know whatever situation. But if you can learn to look forward to no's because statistically mm -hmm. you're closer to a yes, then you don't see rejection as a setback. You see this progress instead. I love that. Uh, Luke Lehman, was that his last name? Yes. Uh, he's a uh, combat pilot, decorated combat pilot. He was on the show some a uh, few weeks back, maybe a couple months now. I'm terrible with dates, by the way. I, I would say like it was just a few weeks ago. It'd be six months ago. It was back in But August. anyways, <laughs> what I loved about Luke, he talked about uh, something in regards to what they did in, in combat missions. And it was the after report, right? It was the, the debrief that was literally the most critical element to the entire mission was understanding it wasn't about right or wrong anything going wrong wasn't the issue it was about how did it go wrong what needed to be adjusted and they spent more time in the debrief 
that mission debrief than anything else because that's how they made improvements and corrections to have more successful missions moving forward. So the comment you just made just reminded me of that. It's right. It's true. We should be we should be looking for more no's uh, uh, because it's telling us that we're having areas of improvement, right? I know that when I get too many yeses, the first thing I think is, dang it, I didn't. I should have. I should have yeah, you didn't charge enough. Right? right, I didn't charge enough. Like, dang it. And I also think, like, <laughs> taking the emotion out of, like, the ass, taking the emotion out of whatever the task is that you have to do. I mean, you, you, you know, walking up to Jason, I mean, you, you take the emotion out of things. You make the pitch. You just take the emotion out of what you're actually doing so that because as, as solopreneurs, as entrepreneurs, as entrepreneurs, like, we have to just do we have to take that step forward so thank you for sharing yeah. that yeah i love that and i want to go back to this the point about your um your buddy who was talking about doing the debrief and how mm -hmm. important that is <clears throat> and i think of it as like a like a post-mortem to an extent mm -hmm. so what i suggest doing is a pre-mortem before any any week any big project whatever it is and think what could go wrong proactively what could go, could go wrong and then take steps to avoid that so pretend i have a bigger project due this week my pre-mortem would be, okay, well, how can I mess this up? Gosh, you know, if I take a bunch of meetings without an agenda and waste my time, I'm going to mess that up. If I don't schedule when I'm going to the gym, I'm going to mess that up. So if you proactively think, how can I mess this up? You can avoid it, right? And then sure, do the, do the post-mortem as well. But I think enough people don't think about that. Like plan ahead, you know, how could I mess up? Oh, my kids are sick. Okay, what can I do about that? Well, stay up late tonight because <laughs> you, you got to get this done. <laughs> and I never know, and that's the benefit of being a parent. I never know when one of my four children will be home for a holiday I wasn't aware of because they're sick, because of whatever. So I have a sense of urgency, not anxiety, but urgency. But I don't sit around thinking, oh, I'll get to that tomorrow because tomorrow is not promised in regards to work. For all I know, Lena might be home sick and she's sitting on my lap watching TV or something. So, again, that's another benefit of those those constraints and perceived uh, disadvantages actually being an advantage because come Friday, I often don't have anything to do <laughs> because I was so concerned about some kid being sick and they're not. And I'm like, all right, cool. I'm going to go hang out or go for a walk or something like that. The, the thing that I like about that is is. You know, a lot of times I don't think we prepare enough. Maybe, you know, Lorianne, you're as a professional speaker, I'm sure that this is a big part of your job is preparation because I know you have brought a lot of organization just to this show alone. Because normally she's like, who do we have next? I'm like, oh. I'm just, I'm like, I'm just going to make calls. I don't know. That's the way we've been doing it the last 20, 30 episodes. And she's like, no, no, no. We got to organize this. Yeah. She brought a lot of organization here. But you're right. that I'm the planner. That, <laughs> but that's that's done. It's done yeah. wonders for us, yeah. right, Lorianne? It's done. It's done wonders. But I, I, I really like the the post mortem. Mortem, just thinking about like what could go wrong. And the funny thing is, is that um, I think I do this, but I just never put a label on it, like you just shared with us. Like what could go wrong, just so that you're already aware of what could go wrong. You've already like thought of your options or what you would do. Like, well, what's your plan B then, so that you still. Yeah. You still win at the end of the week. Yeah, I think that's part of being a parent too, because like every day I'm thinking, how can they mess that up? How can they mess up? I should probably move that. I should move that over here. They're going to break that. Like, <laughs> you're always thinking, what can go wrong? No, I love it. So one of the things I want to give you an opportunity to talk about too is, is there's a lot I know, there's a lot of folks that I believe would really benefit from the program that you do have. So your solopreneur fast track, talk a little bit about that, because I would love for people to be able to know where they can reach you and how they can find out about how you help. Yeah, yeah, sure thing. So the best way to find me is on social media at It's Terry Rice or my website, which is terryrice.co, not .com. There's a photographer in Indiana who has .com. So if you want photos, go there. If you want to learn how to grow a business, <laughs> go to .co. But I put together this program called the Solopreneur's Fast Track. And there's no hacks, right? There's no gimmicks. But what I'm doing is removing all the confusion, the fluff, and the time wasters that go into growing your business. And I'm giving you all the information I wish I had seven years ago. So how do you describe your business? How do you package your services? How do you price your services? How do you deliver your services in a way where you're not working around the clock, but still pleasing your clients so you grow through testimonials and referrals? So you're avoiding all my mistakes. And as an inverse, you're, you're going a bit faster in regards to growing your business. And the way I have it structured, you can actually start generating revenue within the first 30 days. And so far to the point where halfway through the course, I say, look, stop now 
go do this stuff, then come back and finish the rest of the course. Because there's one very easy way to get clients. And after I say that, I'm like, look, stop and go do it. And then come back for the rest of the course, because I'm all about action. I'm not about information. Because again, I'm an educator. And my goal is to make sure you reach your desired outcome. Because people do not talk about and share courses they got a good deal on. They talk about courses they got good outcomes from. And that's what mm -hmm. I'm solely focused on. Love right, it. right. That's awesome. Well, that, that yeah. listen, you guys, um, I've got a, I stopped taking notes and then I just started writing timestamps. I, I so just, just decided go, I have to just go watch this over again. <laughs> yeah, we just have to watch it over again. If you haven't already started following uh, Terry, it's really easy. It's not hard to do. And that goes for anybody here as well. We always ask if you're getting any value out of this, please, please let us know. We also would love for you to join our community when we let you know when we go live and when the next guest is going to come on. Real simple. Text lunch to 316-799-8052. That's lunch to 316-799-8052. Uh, that's because we do it during the lunch hour and that's just what it is. And that's why it's stuck. So anyways, we're not changing it, but we'd love for you to join our community. We'd love for you to know more about Terry. We'll have that information as well within the comments and everything for you to go ahead and find him and follow. Uh, and uh, again, with Lorianne as well, we'd love for you to follow her as well. If you like her award winning smile, which almost everybody does. I don't know anybody who doesn't. I like to give her a hard time about. She has an award winning smile. Just I did. I won. I won first place in a smiling tongue contest. <laughs> That's awesome. Fun fact. Fun fact. Fun fact. Yeah. Fun fact. Terry, listen. This was great. I'm Thank very, you. very, very grateful for you uh, being here and and sharing so many great tips and and information with us and with uh, our community. I'd love to give you an opportunity for a final word that you'd love to share before we kind of let everybody uh, go and go back to work. Yeah, I mean, the last thing I would say is this. Sure, grow your business, make a bunch of money, but don't neglect your mental or physical health, right? Because there's no reason you can't be wildly successful, but also healthy and fulfilled at the same time. So just skip all the fluff, like I said before, focus on mastering the fundamentals, but do not neglect your mental or physical health or the people and opportunities that matter most to you. Wow. That's great. Love it. Yes. That's yes. That's awesome. Yes. Lori Ann, anything <laughs> so before much. we go? I, you know, like one of the one of the best things that I heard you say, Terry, that, uh, well, not the best thing. Um, you said a lot of great things, but your perceived disadvantage is your advantage. That really mm. made me go, oh, yes. That and the whole thing about content and how to connect on people on LinkedIn. And if I keep going about everything I liked, and we're going to be here another hour because I'm just going to repeat everything. <laughs> Well, that's awesome. You guys, thank you so much for being here. Terry, thank you very much. Lorianne, for making it happen. Make sure you have a safe trip this week. Thank for you. For those of you guys who don't know, we do this every single week, Thursday, 1 p.m. Central Time. We just released our newsletter as well, and we'll put that in the comments. The newsletter is great. It's a wrap-up of last week's show. So if you wanted some cool bullet points or you missed it, you can just grab it right out of the newsletter, and then it tells you, who's coming next. And that's the cool part. So you can get registered ahead of time. Anyways, you guys, we're so glad that you were here. Thank you so much. We will see you next week, 1 p.m. Central Time for the Contagious Leadership Podcast. Thank you so much for all you guys that were here. God bless. And we'll talk to you next week.